nothing but the blood of Jesus. And oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus, nothing but the blood of so great, Jesus in all things, I've seen the glimpse of your heart a billion years, still I'll be singing, how can I praise you enough? and sky no one is higher our God of wonder you reign our God of wonder you reign you are the Lord Almighty I'll shine in all the stars in glory your love is like that 
that flows like a river washing over me. Fount of heaven, love of Christ, overflowing me. Thank you. Set me free, Christ my Savior, rescue me. Series over the summer that we're calling V 
TV. V stands for values, values TV. And the whole summer, what we've been doing is we've been looking at 10 classic television programs. And we're examining each of those programs from the values that they have been teaching us, whether we, whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we agree with it or not, that we've been absorbing these values. And what our journey has been over the summer is we have been reframing those values, we're acknowledging them, and then we're reframing them as to what it means for us to be followers of Jesus in the church today, 21st century, uh, based on all of what we've learned through culture, through these TV shows, and what Jesus wants to do with those. And so today, we are taking it one step further, and we're looking at Sesame Street. Sesame Street. Yay! <laughs> Sesame Street. Now, just by a show of hands, how many of you watched Sesame Street when you were a kid? All right, a lot of you. How many of you watched Sesame Street while you were raising kids? <laughs> so this is good. Well, you, you will be amazed at what, uh, what values have been a part of Sesame Street and what we talk about. Hopefully, we'll shed light on what God is going to do to reframe this. And I'll let you know in advance, this is a potent challenge that's coming our way. So as we open up the scriptures, would once again, would you... Close your eyes and bow your hearts and join me in prayer. Lord, open us up to your word and open your word up to us. Teach us, Lord, what you would have us learn as you conform our lives into the disciples that you have called us to be. All of this, Lord, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I love that little smirk, though, too. That, that was great. Sesame Street, you know, we have, we have wonderful characters that are a part of Sesame Street, and most of us uh, could probably name our favorites. I mean, there was Big Bird, there's Elmo, Bert and Ernie, Cookie Monster, Count Von Count, Oscar the Grouch. You could probably name, in fact, if you were to identify the number one Muppet character from Sesame Street that was your favorite, what was it? I'm going to give you just three seconds to come up with that name, and then we're all going to say it out loud together. You ready? One, two, three. Cookie Monster. All right, I heard Cookie Monster. That was my favorite. I loved, I loved also Count Von Count, right? <laughs> there was something about it, having, having Count Dracula in Muppet form. It was just fun. There were a lot of these characters, and, and there, was, there were principles that I discovered in my research that I, did, I never knew about Sesame Street. It was really very intriguing, these, these individual Muppets were made famous by Jim Henson, but Jim Henson was actually doing Muppets prior to Sesame Street, just nobody knew him. And Sesame Street launched him into an international name and all of these characters into international, beautiful children's learning tools. In fact, do you remember just, I guess it's been... Oh, several decades now since I'm feeling very old by, by remembering this. 
when Elmo came out and the frenzy that took place in, in stores like Target and Walmart because the Elmo doll came out and that very jovial, irritating laugh <laughs> that, that was, was taunting, I mean, entertaining children for, for years. This was, this was really the in thing. How do I know? Because I went searching for it for my niece for a Christmas gift. I was going to surprise her, and I couldn't find it because it was like the hot item. And I ended up, I, ended, I forget how I did it, don't ask, don't tell, um, but I did find one, and I gave it to her, and, and it was like I gave her priceless treasure. This, this is what, what Sesame Street embodied. And there were also, in addition to the Muppets, there were human beings on Sesame Street. Do you remember those original characters, the human characters? Like Bob Johnson. The character's name was Bob Johnson. He was played by Robert McGrath, um, who's now deceased, but he played, he was one of the original actors, human actors on Sesame Street from 1969 to 2016. It was a long stretch. But the Sesame Street also was very intentional about doing some other things. Like they introduced Gordon Robinson and his TV wife, Susan Robinson. Do you remember these characters? They, they, were, they were controversial. Why were they controversial? Sesame Street launched, it was premiered uh, in November of 1969. 1969. Now, I know a chunk of the room here wasn't even born in 1969. Uh, I was, hence how I feel old. But, you know, 1969 and the early 70s, this was the season of Vietnam, the Vietnam War, racial tension, racial conflicts, racial wars. Uh, th there was a lot of stuff going on. And so the fact that Sesame Street introduced into that controversial culture, two consistent black lead actors on a children's program, that was not only intentional, it, was, it had a purpose that was beyond just educating kids. They were making some really strong political statements. Yes, a kid's program was speaking into culture I was speaking into culture in different ways as well. Do you remember the older character, Mr. Harold Hooper? He played that role from 1969 to 1982 and stopped in 1982 only because he passed away. The, the guy who played Mr. Hooper passed away in real life. And so th they introduced this older human being. What they did in their research is they found that the kids... The kids were actually learning more from the older individual than they were even from the puppets, the Muppets. Interesting. What was so special about Sesame Street? Well, there were, there were some really intentional things that were done by their creators. And the creators of Sesame Street were two individuals, Joan Gantz Cooney and Lloyd Morissette. They weren't necessarily... Uh, grand educators in their own right, although they had education in their background, they just knew what questions to ask. And one of the significant questions that they were asking back in the day is could they use this, this vibrant media called television to do two things? One, educate kids, and two, educate children who had been disenfranchised from normal society. So keep those two in mind. They are, they are a current that goes throughout all of Sesame Street. And what they did is they introduced this kids programming um, out of New Jersey, by the way. <laughs> uh, and, and they initially began to, to kind of corral education on television for children in a brand new directed curriculum based way and and the way they did it is they introduced this curriculum 
And with their research, it was ongoing. They would shift the curriculum based on the reactions that the kids would have to what they were doing. So, so Sesame Street, even though that there were some constants, was an ever-evolving, fluid educational system that was designed not only to educate children, but to reach out to those children who society said were less valued. Why is that important? Well, let me share a few other statistics with you, and then we'll jump in to the why. This was one of those rapidly growing um, media amazing journeys that revolutionized television for children. So much so that in 2001, it was introduced in 1969, by 2001, Sesame Street had over 120 million viewers in various international versions all over the globe. And by its 40th anniversary in 2009, it was broadcast in more than 140 countries. 1996, ready? Statistics. 1996, what they found is that 95% of all American preschoolers had watched Sesame Street by the time they were three years old. Think about that. 95% of all children in America, by the time they were three years old, were watching Sesame Street. In 2018, it was estimated that 86 million Americans had watched it as children. Hmm. And it was based basically on a simple principle. If you could make education entertaining and engaging, kids would learn. It sounds simple, right? Hmm. Basic and yet life-changing. By 2019, 80% of parents watched Sesame Street with their children and 650 celebrities had appeared on the show. Wow, one television show that is still going on today has revolutionized the world. What does this have to teach us? Hear me. You can change the world by influencing children. Let me say that again. What Sesame Street teaches us is you can change the world by influencing children. So when I looked at Sesame Street and tried to identify the, the key values of what it has given to us as a society so that I could reframe them, I had a hard time narrowing it down. So, so what I did is I selected three, and two of them are actually couplets because I couldn't choose three. The very first value that Sesame Street introduced to us is the value of diversity and compassion. Diversity and compassion. I shared with you some of the statistics. There was an intentionality upon the creators to bring education across the board, especially targeting those children who were disenfranchised. Remember the years? Remember the culture? Vietnam? Uh, racial tensions? They were very intentional about trying to reach those who were in poverty, those who were marginal, and those who were racially segregated. And so they did some very key things. Number one, they introduced the very first black Muppet, Roosevelt Franklin. Do you remember Roosevelt? I remember Roosevelt this was early on. In addition to not only having human beings who were uh, black and consistent characters, lead characters, they, they introduced a black Muppet. 
They also introduced something else. And, and I watched, I grew up on Sesame Street. I never knew this. I found this out just two weeks ago when I started researching. You know what I found out? That the actual Sesame Street neighborhood was designed to resemble the historically black community of Harlem. They did that very intentionally. They wanted to create an environment where the population that they were trying to reach would actually feel at home in the neighborhood that they were providing. Wow. But they didn't stop there. All the way through the history of Sesame Street, they began to introduce diversity in a variety of different ways. You know, we have Big Bird, obviously. I mean, there's diversity right there from a person like me. The, from my vantage point, anything that's tall, that's abnormally different than what normal people are. So, but then you had, you had Roosevelt, he was black. Um, do you remember Rosita? Rosita was the very first bilingual Muppet. She, she was fluent in Spanish and English. And then Julia, Julia was a more relatively recent introduction. Anybody know who Julia is? Julia is actually the very first autistic Muppet. And they are normalizing the perspective of what children are watching on TV so that they feel connected and they feel heard. So what Sesame Street is challenging us with is, do our children, do our children feel seen and heard? Do they feel seen and heard? diversity, and compassion. But it didn't stop even there with the Muppets. It, it expanded and started to include some of the adults as well. And they introduced Linda. Do you remember Linda? Linda was the only non-hearing character on the series, and she was the first deaf character, consistent lead character on any program in that time zone. Now, think about this. So, so Linda, and I remember Linda very vividly, uh, Linda was actually using signs, signs, literally signs, held up to communicate what she was trying to communicate. And she also began to teach the kids ASL, sign language. And so when our children were watching her, they were learning sign language, whether we realized it at the time or not. Sesame Street was very intentional about introducing the different dimensions of who people were and the values behind it, diversity and compassion. So when I thought about reframing this, I was immediately drawn to Mark chapter 12. This is a story where, where Jesus is kind of in a, an argument with some of the scribes, religious leaders. So this is what we read. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, this scribe asked Jesus, which commandment is the first of all? And Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. It's really a, an intriguing connecting point from the vantage point of Sesame Street. How do, you, how do you reframe diversity and compassion? You really don't need to because it, it communicates well, diversity and compassion. But, but if I had to, what I would translate it into is the value of love. Loving your neighbor in particular. Love God, but love your neighbor. And when you love your neighbor, you are embodying love for God. Now, let me state this again. I've said this many times over the years. When you say, I love and care for you, it does not necessarily mean that you agree with them. Love does not equate with agreeing. 
It simply means that in the midst of our disagreeing in style, disagreeing in choices, we are unconditionally agreeing in love. That's what Sesame Street is trying to embody. And so I'm asking the questions across the board, do our children feel seen and do they feel heard? Do they feel loved? The second value that Sesame Street brings to our discussion is an interesting one. It's the value of perspective. Perspective. To illustrate this, I want to share with you a real, real life story. Um, it's not so much connected to Sesame Street, but I'll build the bridge. About a month or so ago, um, I, I had the opportunity to go visit my dad, which I do pretty, pretty regularly. And my dad, as we were driving, uh, told me that his car needed to be inspected. Now, he lives in New Jersey. That's where I grew up. Um, I know that's a surprise to some of you. Uh, Jersey does car inspections differently. So for, for getting your car inspected in Jersey, you have to go to this like warehouse building and, and usually wait in a long line of cars and take your car into the building, you get out, and then they take your car, and, and there's a front-end seg segment where they check all of these other things about your car, and then they roll it up, and they check your, your headlights, and then you roll it up a, a little bit further, and they take your car, and they ram it onto these brake pads, and slam on the brakes, and check your brakes, and make sure everything is in order, and then you go forward, and they check a few other things, and by the time you get to the end, they get, you get pronounced pass or fail. Anybody know what I'm talking about from Jersey? Yeah, so we've, you've been there. Well, this particular inspection station is unique and special to me because for three summers while I was in school, I worked there. Yes, I was a motor vehicle <laughs> inspector. I was a motor vehicle inspector. I worked for the DMV <laughs> in New Jersey. So usually when I started, uh, they put me on the front end, uh, and, and uh, my job was to somehow, and I, I don't know how God, this was, this was humor, because uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't so much planning to be in conflict leadership at the time, but they would send me out uh, to calm all of the people who were getting irritated and aggravated for waiting in long lines. And, and trust me, the lines were huge. And I would go from car to car, registering people to give them a sense that you're moving on, and I would joke with them. I would, and they were very irritated people, but, but by the time they got to the beginning of their journey in the building, they were calm. So, so God was using me in ways that I'd never dreamed of. So, but the point behind the story is that building was huge. It was huge to me. So I would go to work, and, and there was this long stretch of this building, and we each had our roles to play, and, 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 and I, it was an amazing journey. I did it for three years. Going back with my dad, there was no line. We drove right up. The whole thing was streamlined. Everything was different. Literally, I got out of the car, and I looked at the facility and in my memory, it was twice as large as it was. You, you with me? It was, it was bigger in my memory when I was younger. Now, the building didn't shrink. Everything was there. But my perspective has changed. I had the opportunity to go visit my elementary school. Anybody ever do that as an adult, going back to your elementary school? The elementary school when I was a kid was huge. As an adult, it's like a postage stamp. And we went to my junior high. My junior high, I got lost my entire first month in junior high because I couldn't find classes. 
my junior high was tiny as an adult. Perspective changes the way we look at life. And what Sesame Street teaches us is that when you approach life from the mindset of a child, suddenly things begin to change. Problems that we go through seem small by comparison. Even though what we're looking at from our own vantage point, they look huge. What I discovered in my research for Sesame Street is initially when they launched Sesame Street, they were not allowed by law to have child actors. They, they couldn't be paid. There was just too many restrictions. So they had kids that weren't paid and they were not professional actors. So this was a program that was highly scripted, but all of the actors, Muppet as well as human, had to be fluid. So while there was a script, it was like they had to be pastors doing children's messages because you didn't know what was going to come out of the mouths of the kids. And whatever came out of the mouths of the kids, it was on tape, and you just went with it. So they were fluid in all of what they were doing. Why is that important? What Sesame Street continues to teach us is the value of perspective. That, specifically, life looks different from the perspective of a child. What are we seeing as adults? And how can we recapture that sense of childlike faith? Matthew chapter 18, very quickly. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So, Jesus called a child whom he put among them and said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Do you see the paradox Sesame Street reminds us to approach faith and life from a different perspective through the eyes of childlike faith. Value number three, curiosity and exploration. I don't know if you remember this character, Grover. Do you remember Grover? Grover... I loved Grover and I hated Grover at the same time. Grover irritated the heck out of me as a kid. But as an adult, I absolutely love his curiosity. Grover was one of those characters that, you, that he would just bark on different journeys. He would get lost and he, he would just be curious as he explored life. Curiosity is one of those gifts that I think we as adults forget about. But it's an incredible tool to have on your tool belt in faith and life. Curiosity. Asking questions that are different than what you expect. Instead of, why did I get into this situation? Asking, okay, Lord, what are you going to teach me here? What is it that I need to learn? What new thing do you have in mind for me? Curiosity made me made me think of Proverbs chapter 2. My child, if you accept my words and treasure up my commandments within you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, if you indeed cry out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Do you hear the, the curiosity and the exploration embedded in this challenge from Scripture? Sesame Street has a lot to teach us. And in particular, I, as an adult and as a pastor, on your behalf, I'm asking a very specific question. 
can we approach each day with a childlike curiosity as to what God might be up to? When you change your perspective and you change the questions that you're asking, suddenly we approach life with an open hand that God is doing something. And if we can trust that the God who calls us by name, the God who, who created us, the God who is leading us, if we can trust that God has us in the palm of his hand, then we can explore like Grover. We can be curious. By changing our perspective, suddenly life opens up new possibilities. Hmm. I wonder. So how do I apply all of this in a very tangible way? This is, this is where I'm going to... I'm going to really push us a little bit as the people of faith here at St. Paul's. And I want to give you a, a, a few statistics first. First, <laughs> these statistics are really challenging, and I'm going to challenge you with it. Barna Research, it's a research organization, made some projections recently that look at, at generational life in 2035, that's 11 years from now. So in generational life, in 2035, the builder generation, those who were born 1928 to 45, they will turn 90 and span up to 107. But let's be honest, <laughs> there's a large chunk of that generation who won't be here anymore. You, you okay? I mean. There will be because we live in a hardy area and there's a lot of people who are 90 and older. But, but there's a chunk that will be disappearing. The boomer generation, those who were born 1946 to 64, they're, they're turning 71 and older. Their population globally is dropping from 13% of the global population to 8%. So we're decreasing. Gen Xers, born 1965 to 1980, they turned 70. 55 years on up, but they turned 70. Millennials, born 1981 to 96, guess what, they're in midlife, 39 to 54. Gen Z, 1997 to 2012, they're, they're in the sweet spot, 23 to 38 years old. Gen Alpha, those who were born 2013 to 2025, they, in 2035, they will be 10 to 22 years of age. Gen Alpha will be the largest generation alive, statistically. Used to be the boomers. The baby boomers, we're getting old. We are old. <laughs> Gen Alpha, in, t in 11 years, they're going to be the largest generation alive. Gen Beta, they're not even born yet. That's the next generation that's starting to be born next year. Why do I say all of this? Look at the bottom of this slide. Most of the church, not all, but most of the church today consists of boomers and builders. So within 11 years, unless we do things that are intentional, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to St. Paul's church? It's going to begin to disappear. We're at a crisis time and we're at a key opportunity. And I want to challenge each and every one of us to ask a different question. I want us to ask, how can we at St. Paul's invest in the faith development of the kids of Elizabethtown today in order to influence the church and the world tomorrow. Do you remember what I said at the beginning? Sesame Street taught us that you can change the world by influencing children. We have to get to a point. I can't change everybody else's church. We at St. Paul's, we have to get to a point where we stop thinking that church is all about us, and we start investing in the next generation very intentionally. Because if we don't, the next generation will actually grow up 
and the values that they learn will be pushed into them from every other source but the church. So I, I am issuing a challenge to all of us. I've already done this with our leaders last week. I am, I am intentionally pushing us to making 2025 a year that we focus on children and children's ministry. Why? Let me be really frank and really transparent here. I'm concerned. I'm really concerned. We have an influx of children coming into our church. I love that. God is doing something here. And yet week after week after week, we don't have enough volunteers in our children's ministry. We don't have enough. We need to change that. If we believe if we believe that it's important to invest in our kids and by investing in our children, we're going to change the world by, by incorporating and embracing a value system that is Christ-based and, and, and those kids will grow up and change the world through what we give to them today. If we believe that, we got to roll up our sleeves and we got to do something about it now. We've got to do something. Diversity, we have a wonderful, vibrant, buddy-blessing ministry here because it's important to us to welcome all children no matter what their need is. And we have some incredible volunteers who work with the buddy-blessing teams, but week after week after week, Emily Gartley, who is the coordinator, is begging for people to volunteer because there's not enough. I've heard, please don't hear me uh, in a negative way. I don't mean to offend anybody, but I do mean, I do mean to offend our system. I have heard individuals say, ah, oh, children's been, I've done my time. As if that's a, it's a prison sentence. I know kids are hard to deal with sometimes because they ask questions that, that maybe we don't have answers for. But, but like Sesame Street teaches us, we don't have to have all of the answers. We have to have the curiosity to, to be children with our children and to be, to be the ones who, who ask with the youth, what is God doing? What's God doing with this? If I can capture that curiosity then I can just be me. I don't have to know everything about the Bible. We can give curriculum. You don't know how to do it. You may want to, but she's like, I don't know how to do children. We'll teach you. We will teach you. We will equip you with what you need. But we need some individuals who want to share Jesus with the youngest among us because when we invest in them, we're investing in the future. We're, we're at a point where we can no longer simply sit and say somebody else has got to do something. We all have to do it. And when we do, we'll be surprised. We'll be surprised by what God does through us. We're teaching values. One plus that I want to share with you before I end. When Christine and I came here, our, our first Sundays, we, we left here going, oh my gosh, St. Paul's is just this amazing place. And you know what did it? The greeting time here at this service. Because what, what we learned is Everybody greeted everybody. But that, that wasn't so much the, I mean, that was a culture here. But that wasn't so much, it, it, was, it was that we had kids, little kids, total strangers were coming into their, their domain for the first time. Total strangers and little kids and teenagers alike. They made 
eye contact with us. They greeted us. They welcomed us. And there was such a, such a respect and a love given from these young people. We left there going, I don't know what they're drinking in this church, but we want some of it. And then COVID hit. And we forgot who we are. The pandemic is over. COVID's still around. It's going to be around. But the pandemic is over. We now need to recapture the momentum of what God is doing and only God can do through this church. So we need volunteers. We need good people. So I've dispelled the age bracket issue. Mr. Hooper was old. Whether you're old, it doesn't matter age Kids respond to you. But if, just if, you're sitting here and you're going, I, I just can't, I just can't. Okay, identify where you are in the span on that list, generational list. If you're here and you're just not able to roll up your sleeves and help in whatever framework, framework I, I get it, I really do. Then I want to challenge you to open your pocketbooks and your wallets. Because right now in the season, I mean, we're in, we're in post-pandemic, but we're also in summer. And, and so we're in deficit mode. I'm not scared by that. God is going to provide. But, but we don't have the resources to hire more than part-time in children or in youth. We don't have the financial resources to do that. So, if we can't get enough volunteers, I don't want to shut the doors to children. No way. I want God to continue pouring into us. But if we can't, if we can't bring in volunteers to do this, we're going to have to hire people. And so, I'm, I'm selfishly looking at what God wants to do through our church. And so, if we can't if you can't volunteer, then I would challenge you. Invest financially in the ministries of this church. Because we're going after kids. That's how much I believe in it. And I want to challenge you to do that too. It'll be life-changing for you. As you exit today, our kids' ministry has put together a half-sheet list of the different positions that are needing volunteers. Would you pray about this? Would you consider it? You might think, I have no idea. I want to help, but I don't know how. Call. We'll demythologize it for you. Never underestimate the power of what God can do through a simple yes. Let's pray. God, I thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the challenge. Thank you for bringing children into our domain. Whatever it is that you are doing, Lord, whatever it is that you're calling us to, empower us, Lord, by the, by the presence of your Holy Spirit in each of us. Help us, Lord, to see beyond ourselves change our perspective and to reach children to change the world. We believe that what you are doing here is nothing short of a miracle. And we're pouring ourselves into our kids, Lord, because we know that you are already there pouring into them. And you're using each and every one of us. So Holy Spirit, Build that momentum in us and fill this place with more and more kids and more and more adults who are, who are passionate about sharing Jesus. Lord, thank you for what you're doing. So we pray all of this in your precious name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor David, for that challenge today. Stand up and 
worship together for one last song as we close the service. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken and I'm accepted you were condemned and I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again I'm forgiven you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well the spirit is within me because you died and rose again amazing love how King would die for me. Amazing love, oh, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. I'm forgiven. Cause you were forsaken I'm accepted You were condemned Cause I'm alive and well Spirit is with me Because you died and rose again King would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. Cause it's my joy to honor you.
my King would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. It is my joy to honor you in all I Friends, if you change your perspective, life begins to look differently. That God could use you to change another person's life. And by changing another person's life, you can change the world. So you've heard the word proclaimed and you have sung it with your lips. Now it's time for us to go out of this house of worship, to live it with our lives, and to bear witness with all of what we do, all of what we say, and all of what we become to the wonderful, powerful truth that Jesus Christ is alive and he's at work in and through you. God bless you. Have a great week. Thank you.